From her earliest beginnings, Lexi was a warrior. She arrived into the world slightly earlier than expected, showing signs of respiratory distress. She spent her first two weeks in the neonatal intensive care unit, where she was known as the feisty one. When Lexi left NICU, it seemed as if her medical troubles were behind her. She was our dream baby, content and happy to snuggle, but also engaged and interested in everyone around her, especially her big brother, Felix. At six months, Lexi became very sick with pneumonia. You're such a good, happy girl. Followed by another respiratory infection and then endless rashes. The rashes were assumed to be food allergies, but that did not sit well with me. The specialist did not take her symptoms too seriously, so I did my own research and started paying more attention to other symptoms that had not been noticed. We took Lexi back to our family doctor and she agreed that this was serious. Our memories of Lexi's first birthday were not of cupcakes and celebrations. It was the day we first learned that our little girl was suffering from juvenile arthritis. We learned that our daughter was suffering excruciating pain and that the reason she didn't crawl or walk was because of the pain in her joints. The anguish we felt at the moment is indescribable. The years that followed were a dark period for us. The worry was relentless and the fear for her future was overbearing. We became medical researchers and developed networks with specialists and parents dealing with juvenile arthritis. With the help of steroids, Lexi took her first Can we walk steps. To brothers? She was a completely different kid. We were warned of all the terrible side effects of the steroids, but really, it was the only option. Without the steroids, she couldn't move properly. The plan was to move her to a safer medication, but every time we had to reduce the steroids, the inflammation would come back. We constantly questioned her diagnosis and always worried that there was something else going on. You're brave. You're so brave. She realized that she had pains that others didn't. It broke my heart as she started to point to my joints and asking if they were always too and have to explain in two-year-old language that my joints didn't have owies like hers. Of course, I would have done anything to take those owies for her. People she met were initially captivated by Lexi's stunning eyes and her bright smile. What a beautiful eye. But she was far more than just that. Where did you get a jar of peas from in the hospital? That's what I'm wondering. Where did they come from? Are you growing them somewhere? Have you got a pea tree somewhere? No? Even as a toddler, she engaged with people in ways that surprised them. She would cooperate with doctors in the most unusual ways as they prodded and poked her. With all the painful eye drops, the needles, the procedures, and all the awful tasting medicines. This will change when she gets older, they told us. But it never did. So what do you think about the ladies at the hospital? Pretty good, though. They're good. They always let me maybe sometimes pick two stickles because I've been so brave about it. Just after Lexi turned two, she started a new biologic and a new rash appeared. We were very concerned, but our concerns were dismissed with the focus being on her swollen joints. But we persisted and six months later, we received a referral to a dermatologist at BC Children's Hospital. Just before her third birthday, we received a call. Standing alone in the parking lot, I heard the crushing news that Lexi had a mutation of her nod 2 gene an auto-inflammatory condition called Blau syndrome, with only 200 reported cases in the world. Our geneticist advised us to become the experts on Blau syndrome, and that is exactly what we did. But after a couple of years, we were drowning in responsibilities as parents, caregivers, therapists, nutritionists, medical researchers, funders and advocates, while attending multiple appointments each week and finding it impossible to make a significant impact with such limited resources. We knew we needed support and that we could never find a cure without collaboration. So it was then as a family that we started the Cure Blau Foundation with Lexi as our inspiration and original founder. Lexi was committed to become the face for Blau syndrome in order to raise awareness for a condition that most doctors had never heard of so that it might lead to a cure or at least an effective treatment. 
She started a social media presence called Me, My Dad and Blau, and she shared the ups and downs of her journey through videos and pictures. Hey Lexi, what have you been doing today? Fasting. Fasting? Why have you been fasting? Because I'm going into an MRI. An MRI? What's that? Uh, it's something that takes pictures of your brain. Picture. Every night I lie in bed The brightest colors through my head A man dreams of keeping me awake I think of what the world could be It's like this little tunnel mm -hmm. You slide in Yeah They call it the donut Yeah and then it makes this really loud noise. They can make all sorts of different noises. Can you make any of the noises that it makes? Um, it goes like... Zzz, 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 zzz. Is it scary? No, but one time I um, did my, uh, my earmuffs fell out. Yeah. And it was so loud. Oh dear. I started crying. Sadly, we failed in our mission to find a cure for Lexi. We were so overwhelmed with responsibilities that we failed in our ability to lead. We hoped that starting a foundation would alleviate some of the pressure we felt by sharing the burden with others. However, the end result was that we added significantly to our existing responsibilities and still struggled to find people to help. We entered the world of running a nonprofit, putting together a board, and all the administrative tasks that come with running a nonprofit. We were so worried about losing Lexi, and we thought we were taking all the right precautions for her, but the medical system failed her. Just before her seventh birthday, Lexi lost her life. It was sudden and unexpected, and it should have been prevented. When I started this filmmaking journey, I hoped that our story would help others with Blau syndrome, but I realized that the problem is so much bigger than that. There are 7,000 rare diseases and hundreds of millions of children living with a rare diagnosis. Three out of 10 will not live to see their fifth birthday. The families in this documentary have different conditions, but we share a similar journey, and there are millions more like us. This is our call to action. We cannot change the future of rare diseases without your help. My son Parker was diagnosed with KIF-1A associated neurological disorder when he was about three and a half. Um, but we knew right around his first birthday that something was off. Michael was born on December 17th and my pregnancy was really normal. But at about six months, I started to notice that he was kind of missing some milestones. So I said to Terry, I think there's something up. Let's just go see the doctors. Uh, initially, they thought maybe he had just microcephaly or maybe they just they thought he just had a small head. So what I noticed about my little boys is that they didn't they weren't as rambunctious as their friends. They didn't run up and down the stairs. They didn't ride bikes. They really preferred to color and sit down. So I worried about that and expressed my concern to various doctors along the way. I took Chris to see an orthopedic surgeon, a friend of ours who was in orthopedics, and he took one look at Chris actually in the hallway and said, that's Duchenne muscular dystrophy. What does Patrick look like? And I said, Patrick is two years younger, but exactly the same. And he said, then you have two with Duchenne. Eliza early on was a pretty typical child. She had a lot of energy. Um, she would jump on her, her big brother and, and they would wrestle and play around and have a good time. But then at around age three, maybe more towards three and a half, um, things started to fall behind. Our seven-year-old son went from being an active, rambunctious little seven-year-old to being in a wheelchair within the matter of months. We saw several doctors who either dismissed his pain or just misdiagnosed him. After his condition worsened and I demanded that our doctor do more, did he order a much needed MRI? When the results came back, he told me, best case scenario, he has leukemia or lymphoma. This was like a punch to the gut, hearing this from this dismissive doctor who thought I'd been overreacting for months. 
I remember when Jules was in my belly and I would think about all the things we were going to do together. This is our baby. About the friends she would have or the birthday parties she would go to or where she'd go to college or when she'd get married or what job she would have. And what we learned when she was born was sometimes babies that seem healthy at birth sometimes have genetic mutations that are lurking that are going to change their lives forever. It takes maybe about two to seven years to actually diagnose accurately a rare disease. And in our research, we have families that may take get up to 14 wrong diagnoses before they get the right diagnosis. So the challenge really is that in many cases, not only are they not getting support and intervention for what could be a very severe, debilitating, even a life-threatening disease until it's too late. Sadly, what we know is about 50% of children with a rare disease will die before their fifth birthday. But even more sadly is the fact that in some of these cases, these are diseases that if we identify them before they actually became symptomatic, we could actually even prevent symptoms. Jules was the sixth in the world to be diagnosed with OCNDS. We waited seven long years for a diagnosis. We spent many, many sleepless nights doing Google searches. And when we received the diagnosis, I cried because I was relieved that we finally had an answer. But to my dismay, the only information available was the first published paper identifying the syndrome. And as I sat down to read this paper, I had no idea what the words were saying and what they meant. And I was an English major at Berkeley. You think that I would <laughs> know how to read sentences? I thought I would be relieved to finally have a diagnosis. They know what it is. They can fix it. They can treat it, right? Well, with rare disease, it's not that easy. Chromo is a diagnosis of one in a million. There are no FDA-approved treatments, and there is no cure. So sitting in that doctor's office that day, Thinking we were nearing the end of this horrible journey, we quickly realized it was only just the beginning. I got a text from the doctor's office and it said, uh, come over here now, uh, not good. And when we got there and found out the diagnosis, we were told Sanfilippo syndrome. It's often likened to a childhood Alzheimer's. I was really in shock. I mean, to be told that your child uh, has a de rapidly degenerative and fatal disease with no cure, no treatment. Um, you know, I, I didn't know what to do, but my my mind was spinning. And I remember um, hearing them say, you know, that, that usually children pass away in their teens. Eliza was three. So I was thinking during that, we've got time. We, we can do something. We can, we're going to figure this out. She's only three. We're going to figure this out. And it wasn't until I went home and started Googling up about San Filippo, um, that it really hit home because it said, you know, the cognitive peak for these children are really around age three. And after that, it's all, all downhill. We saw the same neurologist for two years. And um, eventually he just said, I don't need to see you in the office anymore. I think Parker is um, fine. Um, and there's really no reason for you to come back. And at the time, you know, Parker was three and he still wasn't walking. He couldn't stand on his own. Um, he had very few words. We were relying on some sign language, some very simple sign language to help him communicate. So eventually we saw a second neurologist out of network um, and he recommended genetic testing. At the time, the diagnosis of Duchenne was made by a three day in house. You know, you were admitted as a patient. They did all these ridiculous tests to get yourself to the same diagnosis you had when you walked in the door. And I remember I was sitting in this darkened room and I just had my head down. And this person came in, this physician came in, and she said to me, so what are you thinking about? And I said, I'm praying for a cure or a treatment. And she said to me, 
you know what? You're going to need some medical help because there isn't any. And the sooner you get that into your head, the better you're going to be. You know, even to this day, I still remember that. And, and the first thing is to me, right? But the more important issue is my sons were in that bed. And they were right there listening at four and six years old. And she was delivering a message to them that was totally inappropriate. There was a time when a doctor said, you know, if you would have known earlier, you could have aborted one of the boys. And I just remember grabbing him by his tie and saying, no, that's not what I would have done. And you aren't here to judge what should be done. It's really difficult, you know, to raise children in general, but then when you throw in a rare diagnosis, um, there's like a sadness. That comes with this diagnosis. And so the future you had planned for your family and your child kind of disappears. It's hard because you can't, you can't track milestones. And that's a big thing for a parent, right? You want to say like, Michael's doing this, Michael's doing that. And that kind of just went out the window with this diagnosis. You know, basic things like walking and talking, saying my name, saying Terry's name. It's difficult because when you look at him, physically he looks normal. And it's so easy to forget that there's something wrong with him. What we do know in terms of rare diseases is that it doesn't just affect the patient, obviously. It affects the whole family. We know that many you know, families are actually having a huge strain in terms of their financial obligation, not being able to full-time work and not being able to have coverage for many of their expenses. About you know, two-thirds of families said they actually had to go into debt, even sometimes essential medicines that would be covered for another condition because your rare disease is not listed in there or not covered, but also many um, medications that may be considered to be off label, you know, nobody will cover it. Even if you have a private drug plan, they may not cover it. So again, it goes back to the family. You know, Georgia unfortunately had to stop working because, you know, Michael has 11, used to have 11 therapies before COVID. So, you know, you think you wake up in the morning, you try to be a, a father or a parent for an hour or two, an hour, maybe you go to work, you come home, you try to be a parent for four hours and then you basically research till two in the morning and then you rinse to repeat the same thing over again. And the stress is, you know, the stress is enormous. You know, it's hard to just sit down and enjoy Michael. It really is. Because I'm always thinking, I should be doing OT. I should be doing PT. We should be working on this. We should. You always feel like because his time is, is so important and we have to do certain things in a certain time frame before the window closes for his development. We're fighting to cure him. Terry's fighting so hard. and. He's doing all these amazing things, but he doesn't have a moment to just sit down and play with Michael. I mean, it's been seven years now since Eliza was diagnosed and um, just watching your child lose her capabilities and then seeing my son have to see that and, and watch that and explain to him, you know, why this is happening and, and all of that is, um, you know, there's... Once you're diagnosed with San Filippo, your child is, there, there's this dark cloud that is always hanging over your head uh, because every second this disease is working on these children's brains and they are going backwards. One of the examples I always use with Eliza is, you know, she, she would sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, the entire song through when she was age three. You know, by four and a half, she was singing the first line. And then six months later, it was just Twinkle Twinkle. And then a few months later, it was, it was the letter T. And it was nothing. As a parent of a rare disease child, you may feel alone and scared, always second guessing yourself. While we met many wonderful doctors, we were oftentimes met with skepticism and a complete lack of empathy. It shouldn't be this way. More support, more understanding, more caring is needed for these families. We have a lot of diseases and we have a small number of patients with the diseases. So a lot of these diseases are not very well understood. So it's the patients and the parents who have that specialized knowledge of the disease. And um, you, you really 
can't do research on that disease or develop a, a treatment without understanding what it is about that disease, what are the symptoms, what are the presentations, and importantly, what is it that matters to people? Because when you're developing a drug, that, that's ultimately what we want. We want a clinical benefit that is going to be meaningful to that particular patient. I asked our neurologist after she gave us the diagnosis, what do we do now? And she said, well, contact Dr. Wendy Chung. She's the contact person on the research paper. And we got through four questions because at that time she told me the cold hard facts, which is they were not going to be studying Oprah Chung neurodevelopmental syndrome and that our patient families shouldered the burden of pushing forward this rare disease research. And I asked her, well, how do you build a successful organization? And she said, you need to build an army. And to do that, you need to do the following things. You need to start a foundation. You need to find at least 60 patients to at least have a small sample set as a beginning. You need to have an in-person family meeting. You need to build reagents, which are cell lines or animal models that mimic the patient mutations. And you need to fundraise like crazy. I think patient organizations have been the key, the, one of the keys to creative science. I am privileged as a physician to see my own patients and get to know the families. Many scientists sometimes don't have this exposure, and often pa patient family organizations provide an opportunity for scientists to meet families, the children, if it's a child disease, and I think that's incredibly powerful. But more so than that even, many parent organizations have been able to raise quite a bit of money and while there are always scientific advisory boards and review criteria set up uh, to decide who to support, patient organizations tend to be more open to what I want to call the crazy creative idea. When you go to uh, CHR or NIH grants, you have to have a fairly well-developed and supported hypothesis. So often a whole chunk of research has to be done before you even apply and, are, and or are competitive for a grant like this. Patient organizations help you to get that piece of research done. And specifically over the last few years, I think that has been almost like a game changer to me. When you have a catastrophic diagnosis, um, family members and friends who are kind, caring people don't know what to do. And they certainly aren't going to, you become an expert by definition, both in the symptoms and the research, whatever's known or, or unknown about this disease, right? And you're talking about it 24 seven and everything you do is impacted by that disease and that, that diagnosis and what you need to do and what this child's needs are. That is one certain reason to start. The other reason to start an advocacy organization is by doing something, you're empowered. The rare disease advocacy organizations are the backbone of basic research into rare and ultra rare diseases. Because in these particular rare and ultra rare diseases, there aren't opportunities for NIH or other investors or certainly for industry to become involved unless you have basic data, unless the disease is characterized, connected to clinical symptoms, unless something's known, right? So without that, you're not going anywhere. It became quickly apparent that, you know, to really move the needle, millions was needed uh, to fund, you know, not just one clinical trial, but if you wanted to fund several to try to get them up and running. So we, uh, within a couple of months, we got our foundation paperwork together and became Cure San Filippo Foundation. And really, we started with our personal story of my daughter, Eliza, and our family. This, uh, this videographer came to our house. His name was Ben Von Wong and made a video. And that video ended up uh, being released. And within 15 days, it raised $500,000. Um, within the end of the month, it went to a million dollars. It was the large, it was the first ever GoFundMe campaign to raise a million dollars. 
It was also the first ever GoFundMe campaign to raise $2 million. It uh, put us on the Doctors TV show, Inside Edition, the Today Show. And this was very, you know, this is only six months after we were diagnosed. When we were at the hospital and the, and the doctors told us that there is no treatment, there's no options for any therapy, um, it was something that we just could not live with. You know, I just couldn't, I couldn't live with the fact that there is nothing that can be done. Um, so, you know, we, we began this journey as two parents trying to find a cure or a treatment. And we were fortunate enough to have amazing people help us along this journey. And that led into raising funds, starting an advocacy group, and all the things you would think that you need to do to get to a treatment. And it's been a very hard road. Um, but this is the only way right now for um, an ultra rare disease or a rare disease under, say, 500 patients or 1,000 patients worldwide to get to a treatment. There is no other path, unfortunately, right now. After years of working within the biomedical research community and witnessing how this dysfunctional system often fails rare disease families like ours, we decided to act. We co-founded the Chromo Foundation two years ago with the hopes of building a patient-driven collaborative research network. Luckily, at the same time, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative was launching its Rare as One network program, doing something very similar, having the patients take charge, having the patients really drive this research forward. We applied to the program and were so grateful when we were accepted this year. Not only did they give us $450,000 to help us build our research network, they're also providing training and tools and mentorship and valuable things that we need as we go along this journey. None of us are professional nonprofit leaders. We, we just kind of fell into this because our children became sick and we needed to act. The patient community and the scientific community, we all have to come to the table together um, because that's the most, most efficient path to treatment. As a parent, I may not know um, how to sequence a genome. I have no idea how to run an experiment to tell you whether Parker's mutation is a gain of function or a loss of function. But I know how KIF-1A impacts his daily life, and I know what meaningful treatment would look like for Parker. Patient organizations are actually the backbone of the patient community. It's one thing for patients to be experts and parents to be experts, but it makes a huge difference if you're actually networked. And what we have had are tremendous examples in terms of how patients have actually not only been able to change the trajectory of diagnosis and treatment for themselves and their family, but also make a huge impact in terms of treatments for other families, but as importantly to change policies, to change practices, is, you know, within the system. And what we've seen is patients and parents that have continued to press the research agenda. I would say, honestly, if it weren't for the patients and the parents who not only kind of get involved in terms of helping drive the research, developing what are legitimate patient outcome measures, raising tremendous amounts of money to fund the research and to continue to press it forward, we would not be where we are today. And that is almost ready to have these breakthrough therapies. A health alert now this week, the FDA approved a new gene therapy called CAR-T that would potentially treat a form of childhood leukemia potential breakthrough for parents and doctors everywhere. Check out Novartis. The FDA just approving Novartis's gene therapy for the rare and devastating childhood disease, spinal muscular atrophy. Watch gene therapy for Parkinson's disease. A new British study describes a potentially groundbreaking treatment. A new gene therapy treatment is being tested at the University of Pennsylvania to treat a rare kind of muscular dystrophy. Doctors use a specially engineered virus to replace the mutated DNA causing the disease with a healthy version. A new form of gene therapy tested on 10 children. Yes. Okay. Last March, he was the first person in the United States to receive an FDA-approved gene therapy. A new drug, Luxterna, was injected into his eye to replace genes he was missing. Jack's vision improved dramatically. We have uh, three different programs, but the main one that we're working on is the gene therapy. And as it stands right now, um, when you like to talk about gene therapy, what that is, is we're taking uh, a virus, the common cold virus called the adenovirus, and we're taking Michael's gene and we're putting it inside that virus. And then what they do is they inject it into Michael's body. It goes into his brain 
And the gene that he's missing gets replaced by this new gene. And then it activates this protein that he's missing because of that missing gene. And the theory is that his brain will be less swollen and he will start either gaining or restoring function or maybe, you know, a worst case, uh, stop the progression of the disease. So, the, you know, if, if, if everything goes well and, and, you know, as we think that it's going to go, you know, Michael, you know, God willing, will be uh, being injected with, uh, with hopefully a, a transformative treatment. In the most tertiary or quaternary care children's hospitals, the majority of children who are requiring care in these hospitals have an underlying genetic disease. Through technologies like whole genome sequencing, we are now able to more and more establish diagnoses in patients that we didn't even have a diagnosis many, many years ago. Once you know what that diagnosis is, then you can think about, okay, so how in theory could we think about fixing whatever mutation we find in these kids? So there is the conventional gene therapy that we have worked on for many years, and uh, these are actually therapies right now in clinical trial for a variety of different uh, genetic disorders. And then you have genome editing therapies, which I like to call gene therapy 2.0, where rather than externally from external sources replacing a missing or faulty gene, you are now able to surgically correct certain mutations in a gene, also larger mutations, whether these are deletions, whether something is missing or duplications, and it provides a much more accurate way to use this technology called CRISPR in a very targeted, fine, precise approach to really, for the first time in history over the last few years, think about conceptually how we can actually fix a certain genetic disease and a mutation. There was an example of, of what was truly a personalized medicine uh, for a little girl named Mila. So um, the drug that was developed was called Milicin. So this is... Uh, an antisense uh, oligonucleotide, or an ASO. Mila has um, a rare disease called Batten disease. And Batten disease, actually, there are many forms of Batten disease, but she had one of the rarest forms of Batten disease. So she was sequenced, and they identified um, her specific mutation. And her mother, in collaboration with a researcher at Boston Children's Hospital named Tim Yu, they developed an antisense oligonucleotide specific to Mila's mutation. Children that have Batten disease basically have epilepsy, Parkinson's, blindness, dementia, all together. No cure, no treatment, no child has ever lived. My wife and I were sitting around the kitchen table and she turned to me and said, hey, Tim, have you seen this? And she showed me this post on Facebook about a young family in Colorado that was looking for help. And they needed the expertise of someone who could do uh, whole genome sequencing to help solve a genetic puzzle. Dr. Yu called me and said, I, I saw your post. I work at Boston Children's Hospital and I'm going to help you. I mean, it's really just an uh, incredible example of, um, well, Mila's mom, <laughs> Mila's mom and, and what she, she did and working with Tim Yu, who is just, you know, a, a wonderful person and doctor to, to try to help. I've been working in, in the field of stem cell gene therapy really my whole career. I started as a fellow at the NIH in the lab of Mike Blaze, right when they were starting to work on gene therapy for ADA SCID. And I've worked on that my, my whole career. Um, and so my laboratory works on how do we do this better? How do we get genes into stem cells? How do we keep the stem cells happy while they're in culture? And we've applied this now to probably half a dozen different blood cell diseases. Over the course of my 30 years of, of working on gene therapy, we've treated more than 60, 65 patients. Um, and in the first, in the sort of the 90s, early 20s, or early 2000s, it wasn't really being effective. And then as we got better with culturing their stem cells and getting the virus to go into more of the cells, it started working. Uh, and so um, our 
oldest sort of patient who's really well, which just from gene therapy, was is 13 years old now. And he's going to school. He's going to start high school, I think, next year. One of the most challenging patients we've taken care of was a, a little baby that came to us from Beirut, Lebanon. The family came over, and when they arrived, it was he was very, very sick. In fact, he was in the intensive care unit within a day, where he spent about two months on a lung machine and uh, slowly recovered as we gave him um, treatment. Uh, after about four months, he was ready to go back home uh, with his immune system developing from the gene therapy. And now he's four years out, I think, from the treatment and just doing just fine, growing, healthy. Developing treatments for rare diseases is a challenge because, um, you know, the, the big pharmaceutical companies aren't going to lead the way. So it really takes patient advocacy groups, parents, organizations to push for it. The biggest challenge facing the rare disease community is that, in fact, we do not have an integrated, comprehensive approach to rare diseases. When we think about it, there are as many people with rare diseases as there are with cancers, all cancers combined. There are more people with rare diseases than there are people with diabetes. There are more people with rare diseases than are with serious heart diseases, and about as many people with rare diseases as there are with mental health uh, conditions. Yet for each of those other conditions, we do have comprehensive strategies. We have strategies that also integrate across different domains, and yet with rare diseases, we do not. I think the, the story is we need help. You know, we talk about, you know, the journey that we were on, we've had no help from anybody in the government, right? We've had amazing people step up, individuals, but we've had no help. And you know, to be left on our own is, is a very scary thing. And I think if we had help, like help us get to the to a doctor that can help us inject our children, help us get to a clinical trial without spending $250,000 a child, help us do the toxicology to prove it's safe. We're, we're committed. We're, we're doing this. This is happening. And we would just love any support that we can get because, you know, one family pushing a disease forward is a, is a, is a an impossible task. So there are there are many ways to help. And in fact, um, for rare disease research, all of the history of rare disease research is actually patients and parents getting involved and moving things forward, either in large ways or small ways, but all of rare diseases. That is how um, we have moved forward. So the first thing is to speak up, um, talk to um your your people in in, in influence in, in public health and uh, people who represent you about your rare disease, but also very importantly, rare diseases generally, because there is power in numbers and they will listen to you. You are more powerful than you think. So again, we look to cancer as as a leading example. So cancer is not one disease. Cancer is hundreds of diseases, and it may even be thousands of diseases as we start to unravel this. But cancer is, is, is a singular word. It doesn't even have an S on it. And the cancer community has just done a fantastic job about speaking about cancer as one thing when, it, when it's not. We have so many amazing examples of where individuals, parents and patients have set up foundations and been able to advance in terms of support or access to care. One of my best advocates is the neighbor. Of, uh, of a family with a rare disease. And I keep asking him, I say, why are you so committed? He says, because I've known this family all my life and I see what they want to do. And I realize I can make a contribution, started up a fund, started up a charity, started up a run. And this is what his contribution has been. And it's grown into an actual standalone charity that continues. So whether, you know, but there's also many charitable events, many of these small patient organizations, they get their funding by having everything from bake sales to runs to, you know, more, you know, GoFundMe kinds of campaigns. And that means a huge difference. You give a contribution to one of these rare disease organizations, you're making a huge impact. And the ways in in which you can actually advance in terms of what they're trying to do is immediately obvious. You know, we started this journey, um, we took out our life savings and we put it down towards the research. And it was scary because we're like, how are we going to fund $3 million when we could barely afford $50,000 that we initially started this research? And, you know, I told uh, one of our neighbors, our neighbors told this amazing guy, Bob, and then this journey just started. And, you know, that same day, this amazing guy that goes around and collects bottles in the community and donates it to baseball teams. 
brought over you know an envelope with money and said this is one of many you know and and from there a month later we had um uh, uh gathering at a beer works and then after that we had barbecues and lemonade stands and and uh, galas bake and big sales and golf tournaments a we had bowl-a-thon. yeah just the community uh, the churches started you know collecting baskets for michael and you know we, we were fortunate enough to have 1.5 million donated to us from 9,000, almost 10,000 donations. And you think how blessed we are to have so many amazing people help us. And a lot of times we had no idea. They would just, you know, set up a barbecue down the street and, and you know, start raising money from like our lemonade stand. And uh, we would see the pictures after the fact. Sometimes people don't understand that it's the little things that really count. You know, there was, um, a lady in our community that thought what a good idea it would be if I handed out mason jars to all the people in our neighborhood, whoever wanted a mason jar could come grab one. The The point was they were supposed to put in their loose change throughout the, the month or the year or the day or whatever it was. And then eventually hand it over to us, which is adorable because it's all these little kids coming to our door and dropping off a mason jar for, for Michael full of like their tooth fairy money, their bake sale money, just so cute so heartwarming to see how much little kids care. Every rare disease organization is looking for recruits to make their army bigger and stronger. You have the ability to help accelerate rare disease research. Even something as small as liking or sharing content on Facebook from a rare disease organization can make a difference. I connected originally with the Kira Blau Foundation through Facebook, of all things. Um, I was on there just doing my normal tour of family pictures, and I noticed uh, an old friend of mine. Her daughter was suffering from an unknown illness, and she described it briefly on Facebook, and I read it, and I thought instantly, this sounds just like Blau syndrome. So I um, private messaged her, and I said, is there anything I can do to help? Like, I study Blau syndrome, and she was uh, very enthusiastic and that led to um, a lot of conversations. But what she also did was the end of that day, she forwarded me a link from the Kira Blau Sound, uh, Syndrome Foundation. This, that was the uh, Lexi's birthday campaign and they wanted a certain amount of likes. And so of course I liked it. And then I took time to go on the website and the rest is really history because as soon as I was on that site, I knew. On December 16th, my sister Lexi should be turning seven. But she won't do it in seven because a month ago, she lost her life to a rare disease called Blast Syndrome. <laughs> You're right. She's doing her muscles. Yeah, pound. Uh, she pounded it, didn't she? Yeah, good, good boy. <laughs> good girl. <laughs> I pulled on you. Hey, Nat. Oh, she did it. She did it. Yeah. High five.
this whole blouse syndrome thing is like a really complicated school project. You have to look up a bunch of, get a bunch of research, add up people's knowledge to make the whole picture. It's like a puzzle. You have to find all, the, but a, pu a puzzle with the pieces that are hidden. You have to find all the pieces to put together the puzzle. Like, so think of the human body as like a computer. It can only have ones and zeros, but if you add two in there, everything can go wrong. So if you add a, t a two in the, um, in the computer, then the computer could get something like Blau syndrome. Mm -hmm. So if you can delete the, the um, wrong letter or number and add, and, but, and add the correct one, Blast syndrome could be cured. Daddy, there's a lot of people who want to help us cure Blast syndrome, isn't there? And they're not going to stop until we find a cure. We're not. better understand it and that means we need to find more patients. We were told there were around 4,000 out there and we need your help to find them. So I'm incredibly grateful to have come across Lexi's story and also have met the Cure Blau Syndrome Foundation and become involved because it's um, provided so much motivation for me and for also the um, individuals who work on Blau research, not just in my lab, but in the field and in the world and the people that I've met. What really refuels my energy and optimism in the future is every time I see someone who isn't directly impacted by KIF-1A. Um, maybe it's a, a friend of a family um, or a friend of a friend of a friend or even um, just someone on the internet who happened to come across our story. Um, when I see those people outside the immediate circle of the KIF-1A community join us, whether it's um, sharing our story on social media or making a donation, that just renews my hope. So the first year was an absolute whirlwind. Um, and then families uh, began joining our foundation, finding us. Uh, on, on media, on websites, and saying, hey, we want to we wanna jump in and join you all. Uh, since then, in the seven years now, we've raised $10 million uh, in really grassroots and viral videos. Um, and we have funded over 25 research projects. Uh, three of them have led to clinical trials where over 40 children have been treated or are being treated. Uh, the people that have come into our lives um, we call them angels. You have a, a, a guy that receives an email that never met us before that comes to our house and stays eight days to make a video and doesn't charge us anything that raises $2 million to help fund a clinical trial. You know, we have a volunteer that comes to us that, that is in marketing and says, uh, I want to build your website and do all your, your work and, and, and make all your stuff look great on her free time and she'd work, you know, midnight sometimes, you're working on stuff for us just out of the goodness of our heart, no connection to San Filippo. Uh, and the donors, the outpouring from, from, you know, our community from around the country and really around the world uh, for people that, uh, that want to make a difference, you know, I, I think other parents uh, with children that, that are typically developing um, empathize with, with families like ours and they think gosh, what would I do if that were my child? I'd need help, you know, and I'd want someone to help me. And, um, and, and it's really, we're really just so thankful for the folks who have uh, continued to step up um, and, and help change the course of this disease and hopefully uh, eradicate it, you know, wipe, wipe it away and, and, uh, and cure it. When we were investing in, 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 in funding really s small research uh, um, programs, at the time, 25 years ago, we were thinking of $50,000 was, you know, hard to raise. And, oh my gosh, that was a lot of money. 
But then as we talked to the NIH, the data that they collected was eligible for bigger grants. And so then we were seeing some of our researchers that we had funded get an NIH grant. Every single donation, whether it's a dollar or bigger than that, is a gift. And it allows you to take the next step. But I also think in rare diseases, you have to look at leverage. I remember um, learning about drug development and for the first time. And, and so I was speaking to someone in a, a pharmaceutical company that said, it takes a billion dollars to develop a drug. And I remember thinking, oh, how many bank sales to get to a billion dollars, right? And then, I, then there was a moment I thought, we'll never get there. But then, I, you know, but then when, when in, the, in the U.S., um, the system works that, you know, and, and for many scientists around the world, the Enterprise and National Institutes of Health is the big, one of the largest uh, scientific research institutes in the world that gives out those billions of dollars. Mr. Chairman, there's nothing that has changed in 100 years. Nothing will change without increased investment in Duchenne research. One day long ago, my son Patrick was trying to convince me of a crazy argument he had. He said to me, Mom, pretend I'm in a midlife crisis. In fact, he was. He was eight. Mr. Chairman, Congress is very generous to NIH, but this disease, the number one lethal genetic disease of childhood, gets only one one thousandth of the NIH budget. No wonder there is nothing available for these children. Our children are not out of their warranty period before their bodies wear out. They will never receive adult status to advocate on their own behalf. This generation, this disease, sends ripples of pain and dysfunction through every family. On behalf of the children with Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy and their families, and all of these people you see here with muscular dystrophies, we ask the federal government to commit $100 million over five years specifically for Duchenne research. This would change the face of this disease forever and jumpstart an important field of research. Today, we're not seeking exceptional funding for our children. We seek equity. Mr. Chairman, it's too late for my own sons, but with your help, this disease will change. Thank you. So it's like a snowball going down a mountain, right? You start with this little snowball and think it can't do anything. But by the time it rolls down that mountain, it's bigger because you've leveraged interest, you've leveraged people. So if we roll forward to our initial investment, to the investment of, and say, what, what, what has been the investment of the National Institutes of Health from 21 years? It's $800 million. We're getting close to that billion, right? Costs about a billion dollars to develop a drug. Well, you don't have to raise a billion dollars. You can, you can raise a much smaller amount of money that can have a real impact. It doesn't take a lot of money to start a registry if one doesn't exist. Or work with your researchers, find out what they need. For example, um, helping to fund a postdoc or a fellow within someone's lab. That's also fairly inexpensive on, on the research dollar spectrum. I mean, you can... For $50,000, you can fund somebody for a year, and that could be somebody's career. So in order to move Blau Research to the next level, we absolutely need funding. And so the ultimate goal is to get uh, funding through a larger funding organization, kind of like the National Institutes for Health. Um, and to do this, we need preliminary data. And to get preliminary data, we just need small amounts of seed funding that can range anywhere from ten dollars to $50,000. And what seed funding can do is not only provide money to perform preliminary experiments, but also it validates the questions that we're asking to other people and showing that people will pay for that, those experiments to be done. The fundraising done by parent organizations is really critical, especially in the early phase of a project. For example, to fund a postdoctoral fellow to spend two years working on that disease can make a huge difference. And, and one person working on it can really lay the groundwork for, for the project. Once there's sort of proof of principle to take it to the clinic, it's sort of an order of magnitude more expensive. And then it takes NIH dollars or a, a million, millionaire philanthropist or you know, a, a larger fundraising to do all the work you need to show the FDA this should be safe and there's evidence that it could be effective in patients before you do the first in human studies. But the initial seeds are planted by that, you know, the small grant to a lab that gives them the money to work on the disease. Way back in the 80s, um, there was the emphasis on rare diseases, right, in terms of legislation. 
to basically acknowledge that they asked. And the rare disease legislation, even in the U.S. and then across the world, provided incentives for companies to develop therapies. That was the legislation, the Orphan Drug Act, right? And that's still true today. So in those early beginnings of saying, um, acknowledge that rare diseases are equally as important as what we knew then in terms of common diseases, I think without an advocacy movement, we'd be back in the Middle Ages with, with, with people actually treating common diseases, heart disease, um, uh, cancers, ineffectively. Because I think rare diseases have paved the way for us to understand, better understand pathways, for us to look at research in different ways. So rare disease research uh, can contribute to um, understanding and, and treating other health conditions. And there are many, many examples of this. So it is often um, these genetic disorders that, that teach us about what is normal human physiology and what happens when something is not going as expected. Familial um, hypercholesterolemia is a one in a million disease where people just have astronomically high cholesterol levels and you actually see things like heart attacks and strokes in very young children. So this was something that was studied in, in these one in a million patients that led to the discovering of the cholesterol pathway um, that then resulted eventually in the statin drugs and since then other drugs. And these are some of the most widely used best-selling drugs um, ever invented. And all of that came out of the study of this handful of patients with this very rare form of, of high cholesterol. I think the biggest challenge of being a KF1A parent is the uncertain future, especially with this being a degenerative disorder that changes over time. You know, we, we can try our hardest to deal with today's challenges head on, but when we have no idea what's coming down the line in the future, um, what symptoms our kids might develop, what skills they might lose, that's terrifying. And I think the worst form of torture as a parent is laying awake at night wondering who's going to take care of your kid when they're no longer a kid and um, you're not going to be here to care for them when they can't care for themselves. And so that's why we have to accelerate research and we have to move as quickly as possible because you know, time may not have run out for Parker yet to have treatment, um, to make a meaningful difference in his life, but I think of all the kids that we've lost, um, even since starting our organization in 2017, um, we, didn't, we didn't work fast enough for them, and I just can't see that happen to another patient in our community. I can tell you intellectually about Duchenne all day long, the research, the genetics of this, the downstream drug development. I can, I can talk to you emotionally if you say to me about your sons and they're gone a long time. I still can't bear it. There isn't a day that goes by that I think, I wish you were here, Chris and Pat, right? There isn't an event, my daughter just got married, that I thought as she walked, she got married on the beach in South Carolina, I thought, I wish you were here. I wish you were just here to see this, right? And then the idea of, I wish I would have seen you beyond your teenage years. I wish I would have known what you would be. I always wanted a third child, but we didn't know at the time when we were deciding whether or not to have a third child, if this was hereditary, if we could have a child that was um, far worse off than Jules. And so we decided that we wouldn't have a third child. And I really believe that all these families that have welcomed me into their homes and into their arms and into their hearts, their children are like my third child. And so the pressure that I feel and that we feel searching for a cure and a treatment is tremendous. Uh, our ultimate goal is obviously newborn screening and a proven FDA available treatment that hopefully will stop this toxic storage build, build up from really ever happening. And to think of that day, you know, as a parent who's, who's lived through watching his daughter fade away for seven years, um, it would be an awesome day to, to know a parent uh, and a child with San Filippo 
could potentially uh, live some type of typical life. I think we're at a critical time right now in the world of rare disease. Over the past four years, I've seen the rise in patient-led advocacy and patient-led research really having it take hold. Um, I've also seen our stories being put out there more often. People are listening, people are learning about these diseases. Everybody knows somebody with a rare disease. I have hope that this will help and that what we're doing is really going to drive the research and understanding forward and really not only help our disease, but help a ton of other families who are also going through this horrible journey. You know, you're having a tough day and you're, and you're like, you think you, can, you can't do something and then you pull into your street and you see 50 or 100 signs that say QRSPG50, it, um, it really it motivates you to continue. I think we have to tell high school students what kind of cool research can be done these days and, and increase the pipeline of people who are interested in science who want to be part of this journey. When I went to medical school, if someone would have told me back then, one day you can even begin to think about how to fix and correct a, gen a genetic mutation, I would have thought, wow, that's crazy. The fact that we are now able to even do this kind of research and explore opportunities how to actually correct a faulty mutation in a patient is still breathtaking to me, although it's been already, I don't know, six years, seven years. I am in this field and stay in advocacy um, because, first of all, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a disease I really hate. Perhaps it's a get-even strategy. You take my sons, you have me forever fighting against you. Um, but I also think that we're on the brink of some really incredible opportunities for patients. We are looking at newborn screening to diagnose as early as possible in the newborn stage. We're looking at gene genetic therapies that have potential. And we have a community that's empowered. And I think hope is here. And it's here to stay. We live in an age of unprecedented opportunities to turn scientific discoveries into better treatments for rare diseases. Ten years from now, it is not unrealistic to think that these genetic diseases could be cured with a genetic therapy. But for that to happen, we need funding. And we need policies and frameworks that support rare disease research and development. The rare disease community is the most underserved population in the medical system. There are 400 million people living with a rare diagnosis. There are 7,000 rare diseases and less than 5% have an effective treatment. This is not acceptable. Lexi's brother Felix once told her, one day I'm gonna be a scientist and I'm gonna find a cure for you. And when I find that cure, you are never gonna hurt again. And mom and dad are never gonna be sad again. It's gonna be a day that we all treasure. And we ran out of time for Lexi but we haven't given up on our commitment to her and to the millions of kids that are like her. We can't do this without help. Every voice matters, every dollar matters, and together we can turn hope into action so that every kid with a rare disease can have access to the effective treatment that they need. from